Hello and welcome to The Actor and the Engineer. My name is Paul James. I am the actor. And my name is Josh Knapp. I'm the broadcast engineer. Here we go, Josh. All right. So today we're talking about The Fablemans, Steven Spielberg's semi-autobiographical film. Uh, he's not the only one this year who's been doing this, and we've talked about some other ones in the past, Roma, for example. But um, but it seems like there's a handful of directors who are getting a bit nostalgic. But I think this one, for me at least, was a best case scenario. I was not expecting anything out of this movie. And in fact, I was fine not talking about it before seeing it. You're like, we should talk about it. So, and I'm glad you said that. So what did you think about it? Well, I just realized when I was going over notes in my head and writing things down, which, you know, I never do, but sometimes I have to, to keep my thoughts in line that, you know, our theory about starting with the positive, I realized that that's an excuse to end up being negative. So in other words, we start with the positive and get that out of the way because I'm not too comfortable with how I feel about the rest of the film. So I do want to start with po- a, a positive. Um, I, I think the movie looks great. I think the movie feels um, like a Spielberg film. I think there's some fantastic performances. And I feel, and I said this to you off podcast, that it might be me. You know how when you get sick and you eat something, you're like, oh, that tastes terrible. And then somebody eats it and they're like, no, this is good. It's because you're sick and you don't feel well. That's why things don't taste right. Mm -hmm. Um, It's sort of like that with me right now. I don't know if it's the mood I'm going through in life. I don't know if it's my life is good. I can't really complain. I mean, 2022 has been hard, but it's been hard Mm -hmm. for a lot of people. Uh, and in particular, uh, you know, with my father passing away and I hardly ever talk about those things on the podcast, but you know, to give some perspective to people, it's been a tough year. So maybe that's having some kind of, um, uh, maybe that energy is still around me and is forcing me to forcing my taste buds to not, uh, uh, be aligned like they normally are. So I have a lot of questions about this movie and I need for you to help me. I'm so glad mm. that you enjoyed it and I'm yeah. so glad. So you have to fill me in on what it was that I missed uh, because I will tell you this. I I expected to fall in love with this movie. I expected to be lit up and to mm-hmm. walk out of the theater and be, you know, a film can uh, generate a mood that didn't exist before and that mood can follow into your real life. And I wasn't expecting, I didn't have expectations because it's Spielberg because with Spielberg, it just is almost a guarantee that you're going to come out with that. And we raved about West side story last year. Mm. It was one of the best of the year, top 10. Um, Can't stop thinking about it. I've seen it four times. Uh, So I'm at a loss because I seem to be having a different reaction to this movie than most people. And I'll give you an example. Uh, everybody's talking about Michelle Williams being Oscar nominatable and that her performance is stunning and all this the above and that Paul Dano is possibly miscast, that he possibly misses the mark. He's my favorite thing in the movie. He's great. He's my He's, favorite thing in the movie. He has a it, much harder job than Michelle Williams does. I agree 100%. And I hope the redeeming quality to the Oscars is that he sneaks in there like Jesse Plemons did. We Mm. were talking about Jesse Plemons and I was wishing and I was hoping and I was dreaming and I was hoping that they showed the clip and it all came true. Mm -hmm. So I'm hoping that the momentum of the film rides Paul Dano in because he deserves it. And the young kid who plays Spielberg, not the youngest kid, but the one who plays him for the majority, Gabriel LaBelle. LaBelle. Yeah. He's fantastic. He is a natural. He is a star. He is going to be huge. That said, I have a lot of questions. So let's get into it. Well, I think that this, the Fablemans is, is to you as hell or high water is to me. Like I just oh. missed it. Okay. I missed it. I thought and... we I thought we agreed you couldn't make reference to that movie ever again, which <laughs> no, I just what? I just rewatched a couple weeks ago and it's, I'm sure it's amazing. It there's, is amazing. There's a bajillion dollars going Taylor Sheridan's way. So like I I don't I mean, I don't begrudge the guy. 
He's got a pretty good gig. He's making a bunch of TV shows with four-digit numbers, and he just keeps churning them out. So more power to him. But I, Hell or High Water just didn't it didn't hit me right, and so um, uh, that that's this podcast will not be me telling you why the Fablemans is great. But it will be me telling you what I loved about it. I, okay. I, it's it's up to you, you know, whoever to determine if it's good or not. Well, let me ask you uh, this question, based on Hell or High Water that you mentioned again. When you saw Hell or High Water, did you understand what people saw in it, and you just didn't see it, or did you just not see it at all? Meaning, did you could you tell why people liked it? I well, we had the whole podcast on it, and I and I think I was just entrenched in my view of it, and I haven't gone back to it. There's so many movies that I want to see that I've never seen before. Going back to a movie that I just didn't like, the only movies I've done that to, like, really are like Mother, which we rewatched. We had planned because we had planned to do it, and so that was one of the ones that was kind of like a you know take your medicine. (laughs) <laughs> Let's do this type of a thing. Literally. Instead of, yeah, instead of a an active, you know, I, I want to, you know, really engage with this. So that, that to me is, is an example of something that, that I, I just don't foresee spending time with Hell or High Water again, which is tough because may, maybe when I'm, you know, 75 years old, I'll go back and watch it. I don't know. But I swear to God, you and I have never fought before, but this might be like our, this might be our breakup conversation. If we ever break up, we're going to, it's going to be over hell or high water. That's going to be what, that's what's going to break the camel's back with us yeah. because you are relentless with that. I'm telling you, I'm not yeah. asking you to tell me what the world thought of the Fablemans. I'm, I am, I have some questions and I want to reflect them and ask them and bounce them off of you. So I'm, I'm curious because I feel like I've missed something. Um, so yeah. So where do you want to go? This is a very structured film. I think that that's what draws me to it. it. It has certain rules that it follows and it doesn't deviate from those rules. And it has a particular style. And Steph and I, we watched this movie twice within the last week. And, and it's because I really enjoyed it the first time. And I knew I was missing a lot of stuff the first time through. I really wanted to watch it again and kind of have it instead of, you know, instead of having the, the story wash over me, I wanted to make sure that, that I was able to pick out small things as I went through the film and also knowing where it was going, watching it again and kind of testing out some of the theories that I had as to, you know, certain questions that I had or reasoning that I think uh, Spielberg had for the way that he and uh, Tony Kushner uh, formatted the movie, the way that they structured it uh, from a, a narrative standpoint. So um, I, I think that there's, there's particular things that, that drew me to it initially. The lighting is so specific. You brought up the lighting. And, yeah. and not only did we watch this movie twice over the last week, we also rewatched Catch Me If You Can and Minority Report. Two other movies that have very specific styles too, um, Minority Report especially. Like uh, as far as the lighting is concerned, the film stock that they used when they shot that movie, um, and then you obviously have a bunch of like CGI that they use in there too, which actually holds up pretty well. It's it's a little rough in some places, but the CGI is pretty good in that. And I and I love both of those movies, but um, but it it made me realize that like there is there's not uh. Is I tried to to bring like I tried to look at Steven Spielberg's career. Um, I mean, that's my favorite movie of all time. The, <laughs> the you know Raiders of the Lost Ark and all the Indiana Jones movies. Yeah, I mean I I love them. And and he's he's trying out different things, but he's not trying to be as uh, specific as Stanley Kubrick, who's like Kubrick's like. Haven't done a war movie. I'm gonna do Full Metal Jacket. You know, haven't done a horror movie. I'm gonna do The Shining. Shining. You know, and it's kind of like haven't done a horror movie. I'm gonna do the horror movie that other horror that most other horror movies are are held up against. Haven't done a war movie. I'm gonna do a war movie that other war movies. Well, that's not true. He he did Paths of Glory. So he did Paths of Glory. Then he did. Uh, well, he started with Fear and Desire. Then Paths of Glory. Then he did that. So actually, War is a bad example. But you know, so there's. Uh, you know, I haven't done a sci-fi movie, so I'm gonna do 
the greatest sci-fi movie of all time in 2001. So those are the things that Stanley Kubrick did. Whereas I think that Steven Spielberg is like, I'm looking for a story or I want to tell this. And he's not as precious, I think, about it. Because if you look at his output, like this guy does the post uh, West Side Story and uh, like War Horse or what. I mean, what what he did, some, he did something in between there. I mean, like, so these these movies are, are all over the place, uh, you know, within Bridges short periods of time. Bridge of Spies. I mean, so, yeah, uh, Ready Player One. Yeah. So, I mean, he's, so he's not precious. So he's not specific like Stephen, or like uh, Stanley Kubrick. And he's also not precious like Quentin Tarantino. So Quentin Tarantino has famously said that he will only make 10 movies. And he looks at it. I've even listened to, uh, to podcasts and, and interviews with him where, you know, he says like, it's kind of like he's curating a filmography that, that he wants to be judged by and that he wants to be, uh, you know, a uh, kind of a very small, like he wants it to be very specific and he wants it to be, um, you know, uh, that these particular movies, these 10 particular movies will define him as a filmmaker instead of like, Oh, Hey, I can get funding for this you know, you know, for West Side Story. And I never thought I could. All right, let's make it, you know, or The Post, you know, let's, you know, let's, we need to do this movie within a year. And he turned that movie around and got Tom Hanks and Meryl Streep in it. You know, it's like, you know, who else can do that other than Steven Spielberg? So, and he's not, he's he's not precious with it to where he's like, no, I'm not going to make this movie in less than a year because I need to spend three years and write a a companion novel to, to this movie. So it, it's it's a it's just a different outlook on film, and I think this movie kind of, if we're looking at it as, as specifically as an uh, an autobiographical movie, this kind of shows you what he may be feeling. And, and whereas it's kind of like, I mean, it's like his uncle says, it's a drug. It is something he can't get away from. Like he can't not make movies, and he can't not be a part of this industry, and it potentially is as at the uh it's at the detriment to his family um so he doesn't get into that but but that's what his that's what his uncle talks about um in the film it's like you know you have that what well, is that scene where he's like family hard it'll tear you in two you know he and that's in the trailer and all that stuff too so played by judd hirsch by the way so i mean yeah, solid solid performance too um but so I, I think that he's trying to at least maybe give us a, a, a look into not only his upbringing and, and, and why maybe he likes it, he gravitates towards films that are specifically about like families breaking up or, you know, whatever it is, absent fathers or, you know, the, the, the parent children dynamic specifically like E.T. and uh, Close Encounters of the Third Kind those types of films. So, uh, you know, I, I think that that's, he's trying to give us a, a look into what, what has made him make these choices and, uh, and how he's gotten to, to where he is today. And it's, these are stories that we haven't heard before. And, um, and it, and it has a, a great framing device, which, which I love, which is like his dad's jobs. And, and they use that as kind of like, not specifically the act structure because it's a little bit fuzzy with that, but I think that it's it's very specific as far as the uh you know New Jersey, Phoenix, California. Those are the three places. Those are the three things, and there's there's a lot of stuff that goes along with each of those things. And the reason why they're in those three places is his dad's job. So um, so what what about it felt off to you? Okay, so you were saying that he is giving us a, a, a look into why he has developed into the filmmaker that he's developed into. So give me an example in the film that shows us that. Okay, so we see the almost clinical way he gets turned on to films, uh, which is very sweet, and that's how kids are. Like, it's dark in there. You know, I used to live in Hollywood. I used to work right across the street from the man's uh, theater and uh, the, uh, the El Capitan, which is the Disney theater, and numerous amounts of times, 
handfuls of times kids would come in and be like, it's too dark in there and we're going to get ice cream because you can't. And I said to this one little girl, she's probably six or seven. I was like, well, but you have a big lot lit up uh, picture. And she was like, yeah, but have you looked below? You can't see nothing. It's dark. And I was like, oh, yeah, that's a good point. When, you know, when your feet are dangling and when you're six or seven, it's a little creepy. It's a little scary. So I get that. Um, so so we find out that he didn't want to see the movie because he was uh, scared. And then when he goes to see it, he's transfixed by it. And then we find out, spoiler, that the reason why he wants to recreate the film is to fix it is to fix the train wreck. Doesn't she say something like that? No, she says no, something, so it's, oh, it's control a, it. a coping mechanism. Yeah, she's trying to control his experience. So he wakes up, and but he's not, when he's screaming and she runs into his bedroom, he's not saying, mommy, mommy, I'm scared of the train hitting me. He's saying, mommy, mommy, I know what I want. He's saying, right. I want but a train. But she says that to him at some point in the film, doesn't she? That, he, oh, I finally realized this is what he... And, yeah, and this she is, says that to her husband. Yeah, she what, says that to What exactly dad. does she say? She says he's trying. Yeah, he's trying to control it. He's trying to control the situation. He's trying to, to, to not be the victim of that scary thing, but to be a perpetrator, but to be the, the the, the, person the in, driving force, the person right. in control, All the right, person so making the choices. Give me an example of where that represents itself in the film, other than right there when she says it. Well, we can start. I guess we can get into spoilers because there are going to be things in the, the later on in the film. Um, like is there for, no? for example, okay. I mean, for example, I mean, I don't mean to sound sarcastic, but no, there, no, no, it's no, not for, like, but you know, Rosebud is. Yes, That's a you're spoiler. right. It's not you like, know, yeah, it's not, it was Colonel Mustard in the conservatory yes, with the yes, lead pipe. No, with you're right. his mother. No. Yeah. Um, so it's, uh, it, so when he does the beach blanket bingo, whatever ditch day, when he does that, <laughs> The way that he shoots, the way that he shoots the film, or the way that he shoots the the footage, is very purposeful, and he has he has a narrative that he wants to show. Even in the war movie that he makes, he has a narrative that he wants to to push forward. Instead of so, he could very easily have been have said, you know, I'm gonna like just have a bunch of guys get shot up, and then you know the the end. But instead, he has a bunch of guys get shot up, and then the one guy who's who's alive. Is is having to deal with that that experience, um, which I mean, if you actually have seen his Escape to Nowhere film, it's not really the same as that, but no. it's okay, it's fine. Yeah. But but they did. I mean, it did look he certain scenes definitely the same. improved his. Of course he did. Of course he did. Of course okay, he's going to. But I have to stop you because what's interesting about what you just said to me is that the war scene that you're talking about is an hour and a half into the movie, give or take. Mm -hmm. In the scene of the beach blanket bingo, which I love that you called it that because that's exactly what it is. Yes, you realize that he can make a person look a certain way based on how he shoots them and based on what he edits into his film. I get that's two hours and 15 minutes into the film that mm -hmm. that revelation is made. So where is any of that before that? So from the time she says that to the time well, we, we get to the, uh, why did you make me look that way? Um, yeah, yeah, that's a long time. That's two hours. Yeah. Correct. But, but, the, but the, then in between there, if we keep working our way back, when he shoots the, the, camp, or the, uh, the camping uh, scene, when they go out to, to the campsite, that he's able to control a narrative. He's able to control a narrative with what he shows the family. And he's able to generate a narrative with what he with the edited version that he shows his mom in the closet. So it's it's not necessarily something when you put a bunch of clips back to back to back to back. It may have been something that that his mom knew that she was attracted to Seth Rogen, Benny, Seth Rogen, um, that she was attracted to Benny, but but she didn't realize how far that attraction took them. Even the, there's there's one part where. She's like bouncing back and forth between Benny and uh and her husband, the Paul Dano character, and she's uh bouncing back and forth between them and she ends up like falling into Benny's arms and then he slows down the film, which she couldn't actually do the way that they show it, but with just like little eight millimeter film. But he slows down the film and kind of shows her 
like looking up into to Benny's eyes. And it's it was probably something that was just a fleeting glance or a fleeting look. But then when you when you slow that down, you can make something look, have more meaning or or you can reveal the meaning of that more than just, you know, sh- playing something in, in real time. Or if you zoom into something versus leaving it in a wide shot, you can give it more meaning. So that's, I mean, I think that, that though that's another example of the character taking control of things that are going on around him. The other thing that you notice that he does a lot is whenever there's things going on, especially when they're like, we're moving, everybody's in a circle. All the family's in a circle and he's always on the outside. When her grandma, we are getting into a lot of spoilers. When her grandma passes passes away and he's off to the side and and everybody else is, is on one side, her, his grandma passes oh, away. Oh, his grandma. Okay. Did I say her grandma? My bad. Uh, his grandma, his mom's mom, passes away and everybody's on one side. He's on the other side. And then, of course, it's a really cool scene where he's just watching. He... It's like he's always trying to frame a shot. He's always trying to, and and he's not paying attention to his grieving family right off to the side or his mother who's crying. He's focusing in on one particular segment of the air, you know, of the whole room, and it's and it's this thing that's defining his grandmother's life, and it's her pulse. And then when her pulse goes away, he doesn't move. He doesn't change. He doesn't do anything. He just sits there with that and realizes that there was a difference between when she was alive and when she wasn't alive. And he does a slow, like the camera does a slow push in. Like you can imagine that, I don't know if he's doing this at that time, but you can imagine that in his mind, he's making that shot because the, the shot that we see on, in the film is from his perspective. So you can imagine that he's doing a slow zoom in on her neck with his brain you know like his eyes he's trying to to focus on that instead of focusing on losing his grandma so he's disassociating by by doing things like that he's disassociating by thinking about his war picture instead of thinking instead of wanting to think about editing footage of his mom who just lost her 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 mother you know he's disassociating by wanting to be separate from his family or separate from the the issues within his family. So one way for him to take control is is his movies that he's making or watching movies, which they don't show him do very often. They do have the Man Who Shot Liberty Valance scene and, you know, but but that's that's about it actually. Yeah. It's just him in the movie theater seeing Man Who Shot Liberty Valance when he's older. So Okay, but Spielberg is not known for subtlety. He just never has been. And I enjoy that about him. Uh, He is an on the nose person. He is a spell it out. He is a, hey, this is what you should be feeling at this time, director. And sometimes he's criticized for that. I enjoy that about him. Sometimes I like to be led down a path and said, hey, no, go left, not right. Okay. Left is the, the scene by the river left is much better than to the right. So go to the left. Okay. But you know, maybe I want to go to the right, but I'll go to the right after I go to the left. So Spielberg has never been subtle. He goes, go to the left. The scenes and everything you just described seems like he stumbles into that stuff. He doesn't, he's not purposefully framing that shot. He is, I didn't necessarily think he was disassociating by looking at his grandmother's pulse. I think that you can't take in what you're looking at when you're watching a loved one pass away. So you, well, I guess it is disassociation, but you try, you focus on something else because the reality of the situation is so harsh that you can't, you can't zoom into that. You can't listen to your mom cry like that. You have to disassociate, which I guess is the big boy word for it. But I thought he was not willing to understand his emotions at the time. I guess disassociate is the right word. Yeah, his but sisters wait, wait. weren't his sisters weren't doing that. His sisters were feeling all the feelings at that time. But people react to grief differently. Exactly. So yeah. everybody reacts differently. So for me, this was a young boy reacting to an uncontrollable feeling of grief. So he was zooming in on the pulse because that's 
you're right, disassociate. Um, that's what was he focused on because that's what took him out of having to deal with those emotions. I get that, but mm-hmm. I don't see how that connected to him being a filmmaker. I didn't see that shot being made in his mind. I didn't mm. see that p- potentially being a shot in the future. I didn't see that, oh, when Spielberg was 13 years old, he has always wanted to do this shot because this is what happened to him in real life. I'm not saying well, that it, w- it went exactly like that. I'm just saying that yeah. he seemed to have stumbled into it. He stumbled into seeing his mom in the situation that she was in. Yes, she chose to edit it together to show her and... Mm-hmm which is a really powerful thing. And I think that's one of the two or three scenes that I think are the best scenes in the film. When she's watching that movie in the closet and the whole way it's uh, set up and the way he's editing that at the time, I think that's the best scene in the movie when he's actually editing it and he Mm. realizes what's going on. And there's a big Uh, dolly shot around him, just like a circular dolly shot around him. Fantastic, fantastic. I think the shot when she's dancing and everybody's uncomfortable. Oh, that's cool. Yeah, yeah. uh, yeah, that's my uh, second or third favorite shot in the film. But so he stumbles into this. I don't think he realized that he made the guy look the way that he made him look. Well, but he I, does he does say something to the guy, oh, that's the way I see it, or he says, That's I don't know why I made you look that way. He says something mm-hmm. along the he answers the guy's question. He says, I, You made my movie better. That's what he says. Uh, right. Okay. That I mean, that's that's it. Like he's he wants that to make a good moment movie. Right there popped. Yeah. And I and it's one of the reasons why I came out of it going, the rest of it didn't pop for me mm, because that did pop so hard. Although, I, and I also, I wasn't a huge fan of that actor who played the, you know. The jock? The, the jock, yeah. There was something about him. Maybe he's new to it or something. He seems mm-hmm. self-conscious on some kind of level. And maybe that's what he wanted. Um, I also don't like that character, that sure. person. Yeah, so. To. Yeah, of course. Um, go ahead. Let's go back because uh, I have a perfect example. <laughs> I have a perfect example of not him backing into something, but him being very, but Steven Spielberg being very purposeful about what the character is feeling at the the moment that he's feeling it. When the parents uh, announce to the family that they are going to get divorced, and uh, they, once again, everybody's in a circle except for Sam. Sam's off uh, sitting on the stairs, the stairs going upstairs. And as his parents are talking, he's looking into the mirror across the room. And what he sees in the mirror across the room is a reflection of him holding his Bolex camera, moving and recording the scene as it's happening. Okay. So he is in his mind, like essentially like, dreaming or or you know lucid what are not lucid dreaming but but he is daydreaming about exactly what shots he would get in this particular scene because this is an impactful scene in the lives of somebody somebody's got something going on in their life that's huge so he's going to capture it on film just so happens that it's him that has the big thing going on in his life but he doesn't want to deal with that so he's focusing on the best shot you know, the best angle to get all of the emotions of all of the people in this scene. So, okay. So see, yeah. this is helping. Okay. Yeah. So yes, I see that. So let's backtrack that a little bit further to the relationship between the father and the mother. Mm-hmm. What's missing for me is why are they even together? What attracted them to each other? Now opposites attract Yeah. Uh, and she's, you know, a free spirit and she's an artist and she's a a pianist and she's a performer or wants to be a performer or should be a performer. So Judd Hirsch says, um, and he is, uh, you know, a technical guy, a scientist an IBM guy, a computers guy. And you see that in the language when he's speaking to Seth Rogen a couple of times. And then a few other ways that he's boring the family, boring. The first scene when he's trying to explain to Sam how movies work, which I loved. I was like, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, That's awesome. I knew you were going to love that. As a matter (laughs) of fact, I was like, Josh is going to love this. Um, (laughs) So I needed a little bit of backstory or a line or an uh, 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 in order to understand the stakes 
of their relationship and their breaking up of their relationship being such an impactful uh, scenario to the son who becomes one of the greatest filmmakers of all time. Although it's a given that that's going to be impactful. It's a given. Divorce is never easy for anybody. Um, even when the uh, one of them's abusive and, you know, they're glad that they're separating so they're safe. They're still, you know, their parents have separated. So I needed something to connect me to them before I felt for them breaking up. By time they break up, I've had so much information about why they shouldn't be together that yeah. I don't understand why they were together. That said, why is she attracted to Seth Rogen? What is it about Benny that she is attracted to? Now, he's supposed to be the polar opposite of Paul Dano's character on some kind of level. He gets her, he's free spirited, but he does the same kind of job and he um, is the same kind of technical thinker that Paul Dano is. So what is it about them that attracted to each other? There's no backstory to any of those things. And I, I, I'm not asking for you to answer any of it, but let me, let me just finish this thought. Um, the other thing is, is that how did Paul Dano, Bert, right? Bert, mm -hmm, Bert. How did he not know something was going on? And if he did know, why is that not touched on? If he didn't know, why is that not touched on? How does he not understand something weird is going on when she has that absolute hysterical fit about not being able to move him a second time with them? It's not like he's related. It's not like he's a brother or a poor cousin or a relative who has special needs. It's not like there's any reason why Seth Rogen's character needs to be connected to them other than she wants it. So the first time, okay, yeah, strange world, strange environment, moving states. I get it. You know, let's take my best friend. Let's take my uh, wife's companion. Let's take our friend. You know, our threesome can move on. Not threesome in a sexual way, just as a friendship. Yeah, yeah, here. yeah. It's a friendship type of thing, or whatever. <laughs> I, you know what? That would have made way more sense that's, to me than what I got even, from. I never heard that word until like a year ago, and it's like that's a thing. Yeah, it's oh. a thing, and everything has to be titled in a clever way. That's okay. why. I, that's like craisins. I hate that word. <laughs> it's not a grape is a raisin. Come up with your own term, cranberry. It's not a craisin. Stop it's not, pouring in on our raisin not, uh, territory. Uh, raisin is a dried grape. <laughs> a dried cranberry should be something else, not a craisin. Not half cranberry, half raisin. Doesn't make okay, sense. Okay, I have no opinion on raisins and craisins, but okay, I'm I, making a point I here. I do have answers to all You're three mean. of your questions. Okay, go ahead. I will They're not start... questions. I just don't, I yeah. didn't see any of it in the film. I will start at the end. Okay. So your last question was with was relative to um why is she attracted to Bert? Is that was that why does he not know was my third Oh part why doesn't he okay why doesn't he know? Because he's an engineer. So like engineers, I'm an engineer, and an engineers can be of certain different uh different uh like demeanors. So if you're if you, he, this guy is first of all, Steven Spielberg's dad's a genius. Like legit, his dad is a genius working on computers in the in the late forties, early fifties. There were no computer like computers took up buildings at that time. Like a, a computer that could do very rudimentary arithmetic would take a whole building to run. So there there are things that that this guy did, and he completely changed. He was probably a part of changing most of the people's lives in the world at this point because of some of the advancements that he made through his different companies. He started at RCA, which is a radio company and was a, you know, in radio and television. And then he had kind of like eclipsed them with what he made. Like they explained it in the movie, but he essentially made a, a tape robot. He made, he made like a CD jukebox. That's essentially what he made. So and and GE saw that and they they loved it and that's why they that's why they gave him a job and that's why they moved to Phoenix. Similarly, he did stuff at GE that IBM looked at and they were like, "We love this. We don't want you to move to to California." So this guy's like, he's in his element at work. He may not have been as much in his element in in his con his connection to her that I got in the movie was specifically as a supporter. So he. And, and this is another answer to one of your questions. Why are they together? 
he was a gr- like uh, um uh, Benny says in the movie he is her greatest audience like he can appreciate her capabilities as a piano player and her capabilities as an artist and he appreciates her abilities as an artist because he may not be able to be an artist like that like he may not have those bones in his body but he appreciates the artistry that that she has whether it's singing or playing piano or whatever you know and he wants to be around that he wants to surround himself with that and that's not uncommon i mean that's it, it that that makes sense to me um and why why is she attracted to him because he's a good audience and because he is supportive and and because he can uh, he well, I, at some point they probably were like oh yeah you can totally do this you can totally be a, a piano player or whatever you know a, a pianist but the moment that she had kids, they were like, nope. Okay, she's wait stay a second, though. You said at some point. Where, is that, were, in the, where is that in the movie? Well, I, you're I, assuming it's not that the based on a yeah. personal experience, well, based on who you are, and you personalize yeah. it. And I love that. Okay. I think that's great. I think that that's way more than I got out of this film, that you actually extracted that to relate to it. You personalized it. I love that. But- it still goes unanswered why well, that is not... Okay, so if Benny says that to her about uh, she's allowed to be whoever she is, she, he's a great audience member, uh, the subtleties were lost on me. Mm. It went somewhere where I was not paying attention to it and did not ring true to me to where I got that theme. I, I understood that context. That was not there for me. So I cannot, you are an engineer, I am an artist. I am the opposite of the, in the scenario. So I have never been attracted to somebody who I thought was just a good audience member. I'm not saying that's a bad thing. I'm saying that, and maybe I need to rethink my life because maybe I do do that. And maybe that's why I don't have the greatest relationships. <laughs> I don't know. Maybe, maybe that's the key to everything for me. That would be ironic as hell, but that I got none of that from the film. None of it's in the movie for me. So it's the parents just... aren't even in, in the last third of the movie. So, I mean, except for like uh, one scene at the very end when, He's father. having a panic attack and his father helps him calm down. But I mean, what did you feel about the the last third of the movie? Where he is in high school? Yeah. Mm-hmm. It God, I hope Spielberg never sees this podcast because I feel terrible. I feel really bad. The truth of the matter is, I'm not going to lie about my feelings. I felt like what trope haven't we seen? a thousand times before. And that's true about most storylines in most films. We've seen it a million times. It's how the director slash writer goes about telling that same trope over and over and over again. And there's nothing new. The only exciting thing was that the one kid reminded me of the one kid from West Side Story. Um, um, Oh, the the jerk kid who yeah gets reminded me by of the uh, jock kid yeah. yeah yeah he reminded me of Riff and uh and demeanor and look and all of the above so that kind of lit me up a little bit but there the the last act of the film so disconnected for me from the rest of the movie. It never dawned on me that the parents weren't there, not for a split second, not until you just said it. I mean, they're they're, always... they're 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 temporarily when he gets beat up by the by the jock kid, and then they're like, "Oh my god, what's happening?" Right, but Who but did it's this to you. Yeah, it's it's minimal. Um, I thought it was interesting that they purposefully. It seems like they purposefully didn't show him in school at all until they got to the third act, until they got to uh, to California, like. He ostensibly was in school before. I mean, he was with the the Boy Scouts. We haven't even talked about like the recreations, like the actual film making in the film. But I guess that well, was we kind can of yeah window dressing for you at some point. But okay. it, it just I'll, were you I'll, able I'll to like? You exa- I'll, were... I'll give you an example, and we can move on to anything else you want to talk about. Yeah. Sorry to uh, to beat a dead horse. When he says a when he's a kid. 
the Dead War Horse, uh, which I've never seen actually. Me either. I, st I started to watch it, but I what I saw the it looks National too Theater. sad. Why would why would anybody watch well, that movie? Not entirely a happy story, but <laughs> the idea that it was done with all puppets on stage is what was intriguing to me. Hmm. Uh, so okay, when little Sam, oh, I know what I want for Christmas. Christmas lights, or I know what I want for Hanukkah, Christmas lights. Mm -hmm. I have not really seen the perspective of a little Jewish kid growing up in middle-class America in suburbia with all the lights, you know, and feeling, I've seen the feeling of left out, the feeling of we're different. Oh, it's, you know, we get eight nights. Um, I've seen all of that. But I've never really, I thought it was very clever that they wrote that the wish, a gift for Hanukkah was a Christmas decoration. That puts it in perspective of how that character feels in that moment. And of course they go, well, that just doesn't work that way. You know, it just doesn't work that way. And then they show the joy and the, um, uh, the profound moment of the menorah and singing and the whole, you know, ritualistic part of uh their beliefs and i love all that so what understanding of him as a teenager later on is any different than any other film about somebody being bullied N not much for me so anyway let's move on to the filmmaking process so we can end on a positive note because now i feel bad well, no, I I just think that the the way that he represented the the progression of his filmmaking, starting as a kid with his dad's eight millimeter camera with no audio or anything like that, trying to recreate the tra the train crash from Greatest Show on Earth, which I've never seen that movie, but it looks looks pretty legit. Like I. I the scene that they show in the movie that the has so many things in it. It has, uh, I mean, I, I wrote them down. It's got miniatures, obviously. The the train is a miniature, um, and the crash with the car. You can see the little like, you know, I don't know what he is. It's probably like a three inch person or something that that flies out of the car when when the um, when the train hits the car, uh, and it's got compositing because you see people running away from the train while the other train is coming, running away from the stationary train while the moving train is coming at it. And all of that's in miniature, like the trains are in miniature, but the people are real. And then they have to composite those people onto that same frame as, as the miniature train. They do uh speed ramping where as the train rolls over, there's people inside and it's, it's under cranked so that when you play it back, it looks like it's moving a lot faster. It looks like they're rotating the train a lot faster. It's getting hit and being violently shaken a lot more than it actually is because that wouldn't be safe for the people inside of it who are acting. Uh, it's uh, all that stuff. So just in, in this one little scene that they that Steven Spielberg decided to show, there's so many different technological pieces of filmmaking that that he was incident to in a single moment that you know he's already seen it all and now he's gonna have to like figure out a way to to take it all apart and figure out how to recreate it and they show that in the next scene with when he's with his boy scout troop and he's making the movie and he's trying to recreate things he has to figure out the poking of the the frame to to get it to oh, look yeah, like whenever good. he shoot yeah. they shoot the gun that it, it flashes yeah. i mean it's all of this stuff the way that he edits the way that he's finding when to cut, when not to cut. The you know, explosions. Who, the explosions, are just how to dirt set up. And wood. Yes. Yeah, it's great. I mean, it's so good. And yeah. and just everybody's on board. And he's also feeling comfortable telling people what to do, how to look, where to move, you know, when to start, when to stop. Like he's he's getting like that's where he feels at home. You can tell that that's where he feels at home. And especially in his his uh World War II movie that he makes He's being very specific to the point where he's coaching an actor on how to do a scene. Like he's really trying hard at that point. So, um, and and I don't know. I mean, back then, I I don't know what kind of books he read or things that like. Did he even know to talk to an actor like that? I think or? that that 
just it proved that he's just it's instinctual that it's natural that he was yeah. born to do this that that rang completely true to me and i love the fact that he spends all that time and the actor spends all that time emotion emoting and the <laughs> shot is from his behind and he's not even yeah. just being shown yeah, on screen yeah but, but the way he walks but that's to my point that you still feel something knowing something when the actor walks away from you, you know what he's feeling based mm-hmm. on what you've been shown. So him walking away, his whole body, his whole posture, the way he's kind of slumped over, you mm-hmm. know exactly what was happening up here because you've been told that. You've been, it's been represented. So when you see it, you can feel it. That's what I'm saying. And what I, sorry to beat another dead war horse here, but I needed that throughout the rest of the film. I needed to see how he solved the family issues in his mind by put, putting a pinprick through the film and creating that illusion of light going through it for the gun um, uh, explosions or for the bullets being shot. I needed to see how the representation of the wood and the dirt and the rocks made the explosion. I needed to see how that thought process got him through life and maybe it, that's not the point I, but that's what's missing for me i think it's the opposite he just watched his mom get ready for this big performance and then benny and bert go and cut her fingernails because they needed to cut her fingernails but then i don't know how he's feeling about all of that but what happens at the end she pokes through one of her sheet one of her pieces of sheet music with her heel and he looks at a hole in the sheet music and that's what gives him the idea for the pinpricks. So is he feeling something weird? And then he's like, you know what? I can use this. Like I can focus this in on my stuff. So that's, that's an indicator. That's an on-screen indicator of, and it's also driving the story forward. It's, it's a transition. Like it, it's a, and if there are more things like that, I yeah. missed them. I missed them. Okay. I, yeah. It'd be interesting to, to, if you did watch it again, uh, to because see that's if, a prime example of what I'm talking about. Yeah, that's exactly what it, I need. It's it's like a it's like a bridge between scenes. Like I think there's a lot of. But is it a bridge of spies? <laughs> <laughs> Stupid. Just so as long st- as you just as long as you hand in your minority report by the end of the day, <laughs> we'll be fine. <laughs> so, um, we're too okay. clever for our own good. Oh, uh, jeez. Um. Go to your happy place. Go to your happy place. So what did you think about uh, Judd Hirsch? Like, did you think that that was an overwrought character? No, not at all. His okay. his whole tone and demeanor had what the film needed. And when he leaves, I was like, oh, no. That that popped the moment he but gets out of like the car. he's like the angel that comes in. Like, he's just kind of like, and it's not necessarily like well, a good angel. It's just a realistic angel of like, See me, this is what you're going to be. And then he said, but the important part of what he says is you're going to forget about life in general. This is what you're going to focus on and it's going to bring you pain and it's going to make you struggle, but that's life. And you are lucky to have found that. And you, you are, uh, he, what's the line from Dune? He will know his ways he will know our ways as if he's born to them, but I always change it till he will know his ways as if he was born to them. And that's essentially what Judd Hirsch is telling him. And it's yet another example of what I'm talking about. He spells it out for the audience. He says, this is going to be the struggle. This is the love of your life and the struggle of your life. It will bring you as much pain as it does joy. And you will need to focus on human beings also because you're going to forget about them because you're so, this is the thing. Like he could see it on him. He saw it on him. And he's also juxtaposing that with his mom and bringing out the point that it's like, no wonder that Mitzi's mom didn't want me to be around because if Mitzi saw me, if I was an influence on Mitzi's life, Mitzi wouldn't have gotten married. Mitzi wouldn't have had kids or whatever. You know, that's what he is, is feeling. He's feeling like his choices in life prevent it. He's actually taking on a little bit of the blame for Mitzi not being a concert pianist, which I don't know if he necessarily needs to, but that and seems ultimate, like what I'm getting. 
And ultimately, all of that is way more interesting in that 10-minute scene than most of everything else we've already talked about. Mm. For me. For me. So, yeah. And there's talk about Oscar nomination for Judd Hirsch, which would be great because he hasn't been nominated since 1980 or whatever it was, Ordinary mm. People. And I love those small cameo performances that just sing so loudly that they can't be ignored. I love that. Um, will he be? Who knows? Um, I've been a little off with that uh, that ability to foresee that. But if he was... Who could dispute it? Because he he sings so loudly in that scene that you can't not hear what he's saying, and it's so it's a brilliantly written monologue too, because it it's almost like what he talks about in that monologue should be the movie. That's the movie right there, or the life of the mother and the the uncle influencing Mitzi should be more of the movie than it turned out to be. Something about that sings, um, comparatively speaking, at least for me. Yeah. Well, I mean, you, you have brought up a few points that I, I kind of like went into this with like zero expectations and I got a lot more out of it than I thought I would. And it sounds like you may have come into it with somewhat high expectations and then you were, were underwhelmed but no, I, at the no, same no, no, time no. That, but at, but here's what i'm gonna say is that you're kind of bringing me down off of cloud nine a little bit not in a bad way but just just trying to get i'm i'm trying to get myself to to be able to dispassionately uh you know absorb the film and 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 try to understand where you're coming from and 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 i can see how it's not as consistent maybe as some of his his other movies i don't know if it's necessarily that he needs a lot that that he needs more time to tell the story Mm-mm. but i uh, yeah i i think okay. that if you left out like phoenix that would be really re- you know that'd be really it's difficult what he shows in phoenix that is perplexing to me that i don't connect to okay don't ever get dispassionate about anything regardless of uh, trying to understand my point of view is one thing. Having a passion towards something, I would never want to take that away from you. And I said at the beginning of the uh, podcast that I did not go in with expectations. I did not have expectations. What I said was the history has dictated mm. that Spielberg does this to me. And Got when it. I left the movie, that wasn't where I was at. So it's not like I was like, you better, you better make me cry like E.T., you know, (laughs) you better make me want to like uh, release that Russian guy from jail in Bridge of Spies or you, you know, you want me to work as a newspaper writer in the post. I I don't want to be anywhere near the first 15 minutes of Saving Private Ryan. Hmm. It's not like I walked in thinking Spielberg is going to do it to me again. I walked into West Side Story actually with the opposite feeling, going, how can you make this better? You know, so there's more of an expectation there than ever. I don't feel like expectations influence me. I get excited. I I look forward to stuff and I look forward to uh, a person like Spielberg bringing me things. But I honestly, the truth of the matter is, since hopefully Spielberg will never see this, I actually completely forgot he directed The Post until you just mentioned it. Completely Mm. forgot. But that movie lit me up. That Mm -hmm. movie was like, oh. I mean, I got it. I understood exactly what was going on. I don't know anything about that story. I don't know anything about those characters. Nothing. I understood every single thing. So uh, Lincoln. uh, Lincoln, by a lot of people's standards, is a boring film. But that drabness and that dullness and that drudgery is what made me light up about it. It's what made me go, oh, this is great. But it wasn't because it was a Spielberg film. It was because the storytelling worked for me. And this one just, I'm hoping that five years from now, a lot of times, even last year, I will rewatch Best Picture nominations even before the Oscars. I will watch things two or so times. Like I think I saw saw Nightmare Alley 
which was not in my top 10 list, like three times, Mm. which is odd. But I do that. So maybe when I rewatch this, I will think about what you were saying and I will connect to it on a different level. But as it stands now, I did not connect to it regardless of my expectations of Spielberg or regardless of what I thought. As a matter of fact, I can disconnect from that very easily um, because, uh, nope, mm. I had ex- I, I should have expectations based on his first two films. I should have an understanding of this filmmaker, but I didn't know I was getting what I was getting from Jordan Peele when I went and saw Nope. Not at all. As a matter of fact, at the end, I was kind of embarrassed because I was like, I should have expected that. You know, I should have expected this greatness from this man, but it's a clean slate every time for me. So the things that you have said, I go, okay, I can see how you saw that. I'm hoping in the future I connect to it like you just, like you did. And I'm happy for you that you had a a, a really good movie going experience. I'm not trying to bring you down. I am actually the opposite. I'm trying to keep you where you're at and I want to reach there. I want to come to that level and I want to understand it like you did. I want to feel the feelings like you did. Well, it just so happens to be I didn't. But at, at the same time, like if a movie can, can, a good movie can stand up to scrutiny. Do you know what I mean? Like there's, mm-hmm. there's going to be, you know, there's going to be, what about this? What about that? That's fine. If there's a reason for it. Th- I mean, look at Parasite. Look, look how just like, rock solid bulletproof that movie is like it's it's i have not heard i've not heard very many if if any at all real like takedowns of that movie and and it's because there's it it, it, there's a lot of thought time energy and and purpose in that film it'll be interesting to see what happens uh come come awards time because this is not the only movie that uh a filmmaker uh, with a bunch of money at their fingertips have have made uh, because there's uh, there's Bardo, the the uh, Alejandro Gonzalez and Ritu film that's somewhat semi-autobiographical, uh, Armageddon Time that's supposed to have a great Anthony Hopkins performance in it. So I'm excited to see that. Shock. Yeah, uh, I know, right? There, there's been there's been others. Uh, uh, Mike Mills had 20th Century Women. Uh, a few years ago, which I, I have not seen. Um, I saw it. I loved it. Yeah. Well, I know it got multiple Academy Award nominations, so I assumed you, you saw it. But um, so, yeah, and we, and we talked a little about Roma, too, earlier on. So it's it's obviously not the first time somebody's looked back at, at their life, but um, especially this year with like at least three of them, it'll be interesting to see if the Academy even pays them mind. Um, so I don't know. Oh, it will. Do you think? It's also movies about movies. Oh, I mean. That's that's kind of a, the, I mean, the artist won like everything What in 2000 and what was that? 10, 11, something like I that. I mean, that's just one of many examples. And <laughs> yeah. we could even start this year, Babylon. It, well, oh, you think that's going to get nominated? No, I didn't say that. Oh, okay. I you're just saying it's a movie about movies. About movies. Yeah. And it's about, yep. a about a movie, about a movie, about a movie, about a movie, about a movie. Yep. About La La movie. Land. I mean, yeah, I, I wasn't speaking even of Damien go Chazelle. <laughs> yeah, I don't necessarily have that same hang up about uh, Hollywood self-examining itself. And I don't have a hang up with, you know, like people playing Freddie Mercury being uh, Oscar winners because people, uh, the Academy, like uh, True Life, uh, people, true people. Biopic. Yeah. Biopic, right. Thank you. I don't, have, I don't have trappings about that at all. If the film mm-hmm. was good and it, and it speaks to me. I don't care what the subject matter is, and I don't care that other people perceive it a, a certain way. And I certainly don't one hundred percent care about the Academy. It's not like if a, the Academy like a film and I don't, that's going to change my and make me like a film. I'm not going to go see Nightmare Alley again and say, "Oh yeah, not now it works because <laughs> it was nominated for ten Oscars." Oh, now it works. That's just not how I'm set up. Yeah, um, Green Book winning Best Picture didn't make it a better movie. It's just. The same movie for me. We have dug some ditches. I'm I have by by and we can re 
rewatched the podcast. I have tried to get at him the whole entire time. I'm just letting you know. I've tried and I've tried and I tried. I just keep and we just keep doing it. Just keep digging. Yeah. Keep digging. Let's mention a few more films that we're not that happy with. Anyway. <laughs> now I, I I just I'm hoping one day I will have something in my life that means so much to me that I think that Spielberg doing everything that he's done for the last 50 years of his career, however long it's been, at least that long, um, you know, because some people have called this film self-indulgent, that yes, it's a filmmaker making a film about his life. He has nothing else to tell stories about. Well, like you said, he's told stories about everything. So he, he is allotted some time. And as a matter of fact, this is the perfect time for him to make this movie. He is older and aging and looking back on one's career and making a movie about it makes perfect sense to me considering he's pulled in all of his life this whole entire time throughout his movies. You've given a couple examples throughout the podcast. So him doing this, I have absolutely no problem with, and I don't think it's self-indulgent. I think it's, I think it should be a given that he does and he should not get a pass, he should be celebrating for wanting to explain himself and why he's had an obsession for 50 plus years. And I love that. And I love that he took this on. And I love that he's worked with uh, Tony Kushner again, Kushner uh, again. And I didn't realize how many times he had worked with him. I didn't know that. Three times. They, yeah. Uh, or four. The, Is this the fourth? Four, I think it's the fourth because he did Munich, okay. which I yes. did not know. Yep. I did not know that. I did Munich, I, Lincoln. Uh, West Side Story. West Side and, Story. That's the one I was forgetting. Yeah. Okay. And if you think about it, those are three, ver four very different movies. And the tone and the feel of all of them are completely different. So uh, if he wants to make another movie about his sister's childhood, let him. Because he's Steven Spielberg. He can do whatever he wants. All right. Let's finish up on the cameo by David Lynch. So I loved it. <laughs> I loved it. I loved it. I don't know enough. I have not seen enough interviews with with John Ford to know how much he was really milking it versus that's what John Ford is like. But in since I saw this movie, I went back to back and looked at some interviews, and yeah, that's totally John Ford. The way in a way does it matter? Well, a you're way, right. It doesn't, I mean, it doesn't it, matter. The you, performance is so <laughs> it's so unusually unusual David Lynch that, I mean, and what was interesting is I saw an interview with Spielberg just recently and he describes the scene and it is that scene. He, he legit says, wow. this guy says to me, you should be in the movies. You don't want to be in TV. Then I walk in there and then the, they said it's going to be like four hours. And then all that, I didn't notice the lipstick, the lipstick. on his, I didn't notice and she it walks first, in there with, with the napkins, tissues. Uh, yeah. tissues and comes back out. Yeah. yeah. I don't think I noticed that the first time I saw the movie, I noticed that she was bringing tissues, but I don't know what I thought she was bringing. I just thought, that I like the whole idea of a no nonsense person who's creative. That fascinates me. You know, John Ford has made some of the most, but he's made like a hundred movies or something. Like he doesn't I, have time to be precious. He's right. just he's just creative. I so, love that. Yeah, I love that. That's, that's and awesome. and that focus is off putting to other people. Yeah, and I and I get that totally get that um, on such a minute level, but I get it. So, I mean, and it's David Lynch and it's David Lynch in a Spielberg movie. It's like knowing that Kubrick <laughs> and Spielberg are friends and that yeah. um, Spielberg brought films for Kubrick to watch, but Kubrick never did that to Spielberg. Never Spielberg never saw a, a rough cut of anything before it was ready to go. Mm -hmm. um, I think Spielberg once said that he was invited over and he thought, oh, I'm going to see this film, whatever it may be at the time. And it, it was the finalized version and it was just a screening and Spielberg was like... Oh. But just the fact that they're friends and just the fact that Spielberg directed David Lynch mm -hmm. is fantastic. There's a documentary waiting to happen on that one. <laughs> and you did imagine? you notice it at the end when the in the shot he was in the center of the frame and the horizon was in the yes. center of the frame? And, and then, then it, it moved. moved. Yes. Yeah. 
Yes. Yeah. No, There's that, that's a, that's no good. doubt about it. We don't need to go through it again. There are some amazing shots in this film. The whole way that he chooses to shoot that car when she's dancing and mm -hmm. the headlight and where the headlight is positioned. It's all fantastic. The yeah. whole, the way that he shoots them watching the beach blanket bingo film is fantastic. Mm -hmm. So there's a lot of great things in this movie. And, and I think that, yeah, the next time you see it, if you do see it again, try to focus on the, that lighting in when they're inside in those sets. It, it seems like he's using a lot of like uh, soft spotlights in the center of the room, like, like pointing on a particular part. Like there was one pointing on Judd Hirsch on the bed. There's oh, one yeah, point yeah, yeah. In, in the, uh, and then they move through the scene and it's not like, it's not evenly lit. It's a very purposeful lighting and it's and it's old light like it's old uh uh standardized lighting for for sets uh i don't know if it's for, for movies or i mean not not necessarily for tv shows because they're usually very evenly lit but that's the thing that kind of keyed it in for me and as i watched it the second time i'm like okay this is it like it's un it's unnatural it's not unnatural it's um very stylized lighting which works in this movie. It's it's a uh, the the way that it's color graded and the way that the lights are very specifically stylized for to to evoke that kind of feeling. I don't know. It it that worked on me. And it's not just like in their house. It's multiple. Even when they're outside, like when like when the two guys are talking to each other and and Seth Rogen says you're gonna get fired and and they're like sharing some Jim Beam or whatever. Like they have those same kinds of like soft lights on them and it's like that's not natural but yeah whatever you know it's it it works in the scene for me i i felt like it was a very uh, uh it, it felt not realistic but organic somehow i don't know it was kind of cool but makes sense all right so you can check us out on the web at actor and .com. you can go to facebook.com slash actor and engineer you can tweet us at actor engineer and we're on youtube just search for the Actor and the Engineer podcast, and you will find us. And we'll see you next time.